thank you for joining us today. So as mentioned, we're gonna be talking about some facility considerations for transition cows. So we're really gonna be talking about the impacts of facility and management, focusing on getting it right from the start, and then looking at some data on bedding and lying time, stocking density and space requirements, grouping and pen moves, touch a little bit on hoof health and ventilation and heat abatement, and then we're gonna end with talking about privacy in the calving pen. So I wanted to start and just kind of take a step back and look at this interesting study that just came out of the University of British Columbia last year. And they surveyed producers in British Columbia um, and they asked farmers and veterinarians to identify the barriers to successful transition cow management. And then they kind of grouped the themes of the answers into these different areas. So one of the things that came out was that it was challenging that we don't kind of have a set definition of what the transition period is and therefore what cows and animals this includes. There was also some ideas about farmer attitude toward health and welfare of cows, including different types of management based on the farmer's personality and their motivation. There was also a key factor that involved the role of the veterinarian um, and whether vets were available, uh, their level of knowledge, their treatment strategies, and then what I want to focus on today specifically is this identifying limited or limiting factors influencing transition cow management. And one of the key ones that came up was stocking density. So if we think about historically how we kind of define transition cow challenges and success, when we talk about challenges, we're thinking about these negative things that we don't want to happen, these negative outcomes. And so obviously illnesses, disease challenges, um, lameness, ultimately this cow leaving the herd. And on the other hand, if we look at success, we're thinking about a healthy animal, she's productive through the fresh period, she's gonna get pregnant and stay in our herd. So all of these things can be impacted by housing and how we're housing these animals, as well as the management and how we're managing them in these pens through the transition period. You really wanna drive home early this idea of lasting impacts. So we, we know that the transition period is really important. Um, but I really want to just give a little bit more data to show how important it is that we house and manage these cows appropriately during this period so that we get her off to the right start. So this was a study looking at healthy fresh cows and then comparing them to fresh cows that were diagnosed with a disease. And they went back and looked at these cows' behavior in the pre-fresh period. So in the week before calving, cows that were then diagnosed with metritis in the fresh pen had 21% more lying bouts. So essentially these cows were getting up and down a lot more. Cows that were diagnosed with a DA had fewer meals and they tended to take fewer steps. So ultimately they were kind of less active in that pre-fresh period. And cows that were diagnosed with ketosis had fewer meals and they spent less time at the feed bunk. So they just weren't at the feed bunk as often, they weren't eating as much. So this data doesn't necessarily indicate whether this is a causation or correlation, so perhaps these animals were already feeling off in that pre-fresh period, and that's what caused these behaviors, and then that caused them to get sick in the fresh pen. Or perhaps something in the pre-fresh period limited them from doing the behaviors they wanted to, such as lying down or eating, and that's ultimately what caused them to get sick. But either way, we want to make sure we're doing what we can to give these cows the opportunity to perform these behaviors, have access to stalls and feed in the pre-fresh pen, um, and keep an eye on them to try to minimize any of these potential negatives in the fresh pen. So looking at lying time, this is data from the Novus Cows program. It's some unpublished data um, looking at their transition cow benchmarks. So this is just showing some data on lying time in the days leading up to calving, the day of calving, and then the first couple of weeks after calving. And they broke it out into um, nulli paris, so animals that have never calved yet, um, animals that had one calf and then multi parous cows. And so we can kind of just see this similar trend um, with the younger animals lying down a little bit less. But we have our dry cows lying down for about 12 to 13 hours a day, which is pretty consistent with previous research. And then as we approach calving that couple of days before, they start to decrease. And obviously on the day of calving, we've decreased a lot. And then they kind of pick back up a bit into the fresh period, averaging about 10 hours in the fresh period. And we usually see mature lactating animals in mid lactation lying down for about 11, 11 and a half hours a day. So again, this is data from Novus. Um, this is unpublished, but this is from about 20 herds that they've looked at for the transition period. And they followed those animals 
from the free fresh through the fresh pen. And then they also um, put some production data back to it as well. So this is showing the relationship between herd line time in the fresh pen compared to milk production in pounds. And in this case, in this data set, they found a relationship that ended up with about five and a half pounds of milk for every additional hour of lying time in that fresh pen. Um, looking at Rick Grant's data from the Miner Institute, when they've looked at this in um, regular lactating pens, we found a relationship of about one hour of lying time equaling about three and a half pounds of milk. As I said, this is unpublished data, but it's still kind of shocking, I think, just to show us it really is important that we're letting these girls lie down in a comfortable stall and maximize that lying time in that fresh pen because it is going to translate into production. So one of the best ways that we can make that stall more comfortable is bedding. So we need to provide a good amount of clean, dry, soft bedding. We see higher lying time on deep bedded stalls compared to mattresses or water beds. And that translates also to a box stall. So if we have a box stall, the deeper the bedding is, the more comfortable it is, the more she's going to lie down. We also know that there's lower lameness prevalence and fewer leg injuries when we provide more bedding. I'm not going to get into all the details of stall dimensions, but ultimately we want to make sure these stalls are sized appropriately for the animal. So as we can see in this picture, this is a tie stall barn, but there's a huge variation in animal size when we're looking at transition cows. We know that these girls are going to be a little bit bigger as they're um, nearing the end of a pregnancy and then they need a little bit more space in that pre-fresh and fresh pen, um, but just recognizing too which group of animals we're looking at. So here's just some of the outlines of some of the stall sizes that are recommended from the University of Wisconsin Dairyland Initiative site. I also included some tie stall dimensions from OMAFRA as well as a few studies in the US. And ultimately the tie stall definitions are based off of the cow size. So we look at the cow size, and then from there, uh, they would suggest to you how big the stall is. Just some examples of ways that we can improve stall comfort, ways that farmers are getting more creative and trying to adapt our stalls and just make them a little bit more comfortable for these larger animals. On the left there, we have some uh, green stalls or flexible stalls. These are starting to be used more by, by producers. And I think the key here is that they're used selectively. So these stalls may not be the best option for every animal. I've heard some producers get frustrated um, if they put young heifers in there and the heifers are taking advantage of the flexibility, making the stalls dirty, kind of abusing that space. But I've heard positive things from producers that have used them targeted as at these larger pre-fresh and fresh animals that need a little bit more space, maybe just have a little bit more trouble getting up and down and just want a little bit more flexibility in the stalls to stay comfortable. And then on the right hand side, there is a picture of a freestall barn where they've had the wall built out a couple of feet out away from the end of the stall. So that's providing these girls a lot more lunge space and the ability to really use that stall and get up and down freely without hitting any walls or curtains. So going back to that uh, original study, looking at factors that might influence transition cow management and success, one of the keys that came up was stocking density. But what was interesting was within that study, the farmers disagreed about what was considered overstocked. Farmers were arguing about whether a barn was full versus overstocked, and that differed whether uh, between farmers, whether they thought it was full or overstocked, as well as what does stocking density mean? Are we talking about stalls? Are we talking about feed bunk space? So we're going to go through some of that. So when we talk about stocking density in the transition period, it is recommended that we have less than 100% stocking density at the stalls for that pre-fresh and fresh pen. So this means that every animal in that pen should have at least one stall to lie down in. In an ideal world, we would be closer to about 80%, but recommend recognizing that that might be a more of a lofty goal. So as long as we're at that 100% or less, I think that's a good place to be. And also just keep in mind that we want to build these pens for about 140% of our average number of calvings. Most farms tend to have some months where they have fewer calvings and then they have some months where they have a lot of calving. So we need to make sure that we're not just building this pen for an average number of calvings because then for a few months of the year, it's gonna be greatly overstocked. So making sure that we're oversizing them already so that we can accommodate those months where we have a slug of calvings. If we're looking at a bedded pack, stocking density and space requirements, we're looking at at least 100 square feet of bedded space. If you're gonna include 
um, the feed alley space as well and kind of look at the whole pen, then that recommendation increases up to about 150 square feet per, per cow. For the feed bunk, it's suggested uh, or recommended that we have 30 inches or greater of linear feed bunk space per cow. Usually in lactating pens, it's about 24 inches. So headlocks usually come in about 24 inch space, but there are 30 inch headlocks as well. But just recognizing if you have those 24 inch headlocks, obviously then we have to have a lower stocking density. So we just are providing those girls more space when they're eating. We know from previous studies that headlocks can reduce feed bunk displacements and aggressive interactions uh, compared to an open post and rail bunk. So it's just providing those animals with a little bit more protection. So especially if we're gonna be commingling heifers with mature cows, providing headlocks can be um, a good step towards giving her just a little bit more protection at the feed bunk from getting displaced. Also need to keep in mind when we're looking at feed bunk space, uh, whether we're talking about a two row pen or a three row pen. So in the Northeast, we see a lot of lactating animals being housed in three row pens. I think we're having a trend now kind of recognizing some of the challenges with this and a lot of farms are now building transition facilities that have a two row pen but recognizing that if we have a three row pen then we potentially have more animals with less feed bunk space so just how are we going to handle that and manage that one way is if we have a few more crossovers or larger crossovers that adds a bit more bunk space without adding a lot of stalls Water is also really important. Uh, I think we're starting to recognize a bit more about how important it is and maybe how, how we've been lacking in some cases in providing enough water space and access. So it's now recommended that we have at least three and a half inches of linear water space per cow and providing multiple water troughs throughout the pen so that one dominant cow can't just stand at the water trough and block it for as long as she wants. And then we need to maintain these troughs. So making sure that we're cleaning them and making sure that they're filling at the right rates and staying full of water. So these girls have access to clean, fresh water. Looking at alleys and crossovers, recommendations similar to stalls and other things keep getting bigger. So it's now recommended that we have about 10 to 12 feet for a stall alley and about 14 feet wide for a feed alley so that animals can be eating and other cows can be passing behind them without disturbing them. Crossovers are recommended to be about 12 feet wide plus space for the water. And I believe Dave touched on this a couple of weeks ago. We want those crossovers located about every 25 stalls so that cows don't have to walk further than about 50 feet to get access to either feed, to water, or to, to lie down in a stall. Um, and just this example here of a double, ride, double wide crossover provides animals access to water on both sides, as well as uh, it's gonna guarantee a bit more bunk space for the number of stalls in that pen. If we're looking at some grouping and pen moves, we've talked about a little bit about the benefit to heifers when they're housed separately than mature cows. So there's less competition for feed and stalls. And if we are gonna commingle them, we need to make sure that stalls are sized appropriately for all the animals in the pen and that we're not overcrowding. So we're not putting extra pressure on those younger animals and forcing them to compete for resources. And obviously we're gonna have some pen moves as we're moving animals from a far off pen to potentially a close up pen, to a calving pen, to a fresh pen. And this little graphic here on the right from Ken Nordland in Wisconsin, just kind of outlines some of the social turmoil, essentially in a pen looking at different pen moves. So the first one there, we have weekly entries in the pen. So every time animals enter the pen, we're gonna have some social stress. And then after a few days, it'll calm down and we'll get stable again. And then we add another group of animals to the pen and then if you looked at daily entries into the pen, you kind of see how that's just maintaining this level of constant social stress versus more of like an all-in, all-out system where we have one entry into the pen, takes the animals a few days to adjust, and then they're good to go. So we do want to try to limit pen moves, recognizing that, you know, sometimes things happen and depending on your pen size and location, but we do want to try to limit pen moves, especially in that week leading up to calving, because we can see these negative effects of regrouping for up to three days after moving. Um, and that includes increased aggressive interactions, reduced dry matter intake. And if you're in a lactating pen, we can even see some drops in production. So we don't usually talk about hoof trimming and foot baths and lameness when we're talking about transition cows, but I did wanna talk about it. Um, I know I'm kind of cheating here, especially when we just talked about the importance of a definition of a transition time. But going back to kind of that dry off period, looking at hoof trimming and foot baths, common times, to trim cows are at that dry off period and then again in mid lactation. So we wanna make sure that these animals that are entering the transition pen and this transition period are coming in on, on good healthy hooves. 
So making sure that we're looking at these animals at that dry off, we don't want to have to be trimming her right before calving unless it's absolutely necessary. And we, we want to be on a regular trimming schedule. So studies have found that lameness is higher when the hooves are only trimmed when someone decides it's needed compared to a farm that has a set schedule and trims cows regularly either once or twice annually. To kind of go along with this is the idea of access to pasture. So I know that there's definitely weather constraints and location of, of land and regulations that might limit our ability to put cows out on pasture. But when studies have looked at providing access to pasture, that has been associated with lower herd level lameness. And that's even if we can just get those cows outside during the dry period, that still can have a beneficial effect on overall lameness in the herd. And specifically, um, this, this graph on the bottom right here, this study looked at housing cows outside versus inside in a free stall. And they found that gait improved within a week or two when the cows were provided access to pasture. So it is beneficial if we can get these cows off concrete and outside if possible. And if we can't, then just understanding what does that mean? It means that the, these cows do benefit from a softer lying surface and standing surface. So how can we kind of adapt that and bring those ideas inside into a transition pen? So more bedding, larger stalls, maybe some box stalls or bedded packs, that kind of thing. Another idea too is just this idea of time budgets. Probably all seen this graph of the pie chart of, of what a cow needs to do in a day. And so I just want to take a step back and just remind ourselves, what are we asking fresh cows to do? First of all, she's recovering from calving. So that's no minor thing. She's also starting to lactate. So she's going to have increased dry matter intake and water intake. There was also a, a regrouping probably. And then we also have this added demand now for time spent milking. So she's going to be out of her pen to milk as well as health checks and probably daily lockups. So just as a reminder in terms of how we're managing these animals, where are they located? Hopefully they're close to the parlor. Hopefully they're in a pen that's sized appropriately to the parlor so she's not spending too much time standing out of the pen in the holding area. And we're not having them locked up on a daily basis for hours at a time. We wanna be efficient with how we're checking these cows and doing our health checks so they're not adding constraints to her time budget and added stressors when we want her to be recovering from calving and starting to make milk. So switching gears just a little bit, talking about ventilation and then some heat abatement. Our goal with a good ventilation system is to remove dirty air and replace it with clean air so that we're removing odors and gases and dust. And there's different targets depending on the season. But ultimately, if we're talking about a, a summer situation, um, we're gonna want about one air exchange per minute. And that is also gonna be dependent on how heavily we've stocked our barn. And we're usually targeting an airspeed of about 200 to 400 feet per minute at the cow level. So also remembering we want the air to be targeted at the cow level. It's always when, you know, in the summer, when it's a hot summer day and you walk into a barn, there's usually great airflow down the middle of the feed bunk or the feed alley. But what is it like when you step in the pen, you're in amongst the cows, uh, making sure there's still the airspeed there and we're getting air exchanges throughout the whole barn. And for heat abatement, our goals are to cool cows and reduce the impacts of heat stress. Menelenko has suggested some priority areas to focus on would be that holding area and then the maternity and close up and fresh pen. So that transition period is one of the first places that you should be providing heat abatement. This is a summary of studies looking at the impacts on production when we're looking at heat stressed dry cows compared to cooled dry cows. And on average, when we provided heat abatement to dry cows, there was an increase in production of 11 pounds a day. Um, so really would pay off to invest in some heat abatement for dry cows. In driving home that message of lasting impacts of the transition pen, um, not only is providing heat abatement gonna have an impact on that cow, it's also gonna have an impact on the next generation. So it's gonna have an impact on that calf in utero. So when we look at heat stressed uh, dams and, and cooled dams, when we look at their calf, when we provide heat abatement, we do see larger birth weights and weaning weights and greater IgG absorption. So we're, we're getting bigger, stronger, healthier calves coming out of these cooled cows. And the last topic I want to talk about is calving pen privacy. So this is kind of a newer idea um, and more and more research is being done on it. So I just want to present some of the, um, a couple studies that have looked at potentially some of the benefits of providing privacy at calving. So we think about cows traditionally when they calved, they would kind of seclude themselves 
from the herd and go find um, a quieter place to have their calf and then kind of re-enter the herd um, a little while after. That's obviously not possible in a, a commercial barn where we're not giving them usually enough space to do so or the ability to do so. And one of the first studies done at the University of British Columbia in this area, they put a cow in a calving pen and they had kind of an open area versus a shelter area. And they saw where the calves or where the cows chose to calve. And they found that more of them chose the shelter and specifically during the daytime. Um, so maybe they preferred to do it when um, they knew kind of they were a little bit more exposed, there was more going on in the barn, more people around, it was noisier, and they sought out that shelter. A follow-up study then looked at also the impacts of stocking density and looking at what this would be like in a group setting. So what they did was they took um, either high stocking density or low stocking density, and they had these pictures of the pen outline. So you can see they kind of broke it up into a grid so they could just determine where within that pen cows chose to calve. So we had either a, a high stocking density pen or a low stocking density calving pen where we had a group of animals that were gonna be calving. And then the ones on the top, you can see this flashed bar down the middle that is showing uh, a calving blind. So they put up a wall in the pen to provide kind of a shelter or a place where these cows could potentially hide behind when they were calving. And then they used videos and they watched to see where these animals calved. So basically they tried to get away from other animals and utilize that privacy. So the higher stocking density are the ones on the left and the lower stocking density are the ones on the right. Um, they had the control of the no calving blind just to make sure that it wasn't just that part of the pen by chance that the cows chose. And we can see the darker squares means that more animals calved in that area. So you can see the one that has the blind and the higher stocking density is the second to highest darkness. And then the low stocking density, the one with the blind is the, the highest darkness. So basically when we gave these animals a chance to hide and get away from other animals, um, they did choose to go behind this privacy blind. And um, they were able to do this more so when we provided them with more space. So in a lower stocking density system, most of them chose to do the blind and it was easier to get away from other animals. Whereas in the higher stocking density system, it was a little bit harder to get away from other animals. And especially too, they looked at um, commingling. So they had heifers and mature cows, and they found that the heifers had a greater distance from other animals compared to the cows. So again, those heifers need to be taken into consideration in how we're housing these commingled groups. So overall, in the close-up and the calving and the fresh pens, we wanna make sure we have large, well-bedded lying surfaces, um, low stall and feed bunk and water stocking density. So making sure we're giving animals the chance to access these resources. Ideally, you try to keep heifers and mature cows separate, but if not, just recognize then how we need to manage them appropriately when commingled. Limit our pen moves for that week before calving. Really need to make sure we're implementing heat abatement throughout the transition period, and then potentially look at um, offering some, some privacy at calving. Thank you very much. That's all I have today. And now hopefully we have some time for questions.